We're going to continue in our verse by verse of the book of Romans. And this is going to be Romans chapter 3. And I want to talk about the subject, can you be saved? A lot of people will tell you that maybe you've reached some kind of deadline or something and you can no longer be saved. But I'm going to tell you the the requirements that are there that you need to be saved. Number one, has the word came to you? Have you heard the gospel? Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Has someone given you the word? Have they given you the gospel? Have they told you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? When I got saved, the preacher didn't come out with the gospel, but he did have me realizing I was a sinner. And since I had already heard the gospel before, all I needed to do was get down and believe that gospel. Uh, My grandparents told me the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ years earlier. And then years later, when I realized just really realized I was a sinner, I believed in my heart to salvation. And a person needs to hear the gospel to believe it. You can see it on gospel tracks. You can see it on billboards or anywhere. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 1 through 3. It says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief... Make the faith of God without effect. It says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? So it's basically saying, If the uncircumcised Gentile who keeps the law written in his heart is just as good as the the circumcised Jew, then what advantage is there for the Jews? They had one advantage. They had the oracles of God. And the Gentiles didn't have the oracles of God. The oracles would be like oral. It is what God said. And just like those Jews had what God said, they had the word of God. In America, we are blessed with having the oracles of God. The Bible is everywhere. God has given us his word in this country so much that even lost people know more Bible than a lot of religious people in the world. And most people in the South have heard the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And if you've heard that gospel, then you can be saved by believing that gospel. I don't believe a person can be saved if they don't even know what's going to save them. That's why we need to tell them. So if you know how to be saved and you know you're a sinner, then you can be saved. There's a lot of people that's heard the gospel, but they're just in rejection of it. And the word has come to them, and they just keep rejecting it and rejecting it. If you, if you know the gospel, and you'll receive that as your payment for sin, then you can be saved just like anybody else has gotten saved. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are. Maybe you're a sodomite, maybe you're a pedophile, maybe you're a murderer. You can still be saved. Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Romans 3, 1 through 3, it says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God, what God said. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? The answer is no. Just because you don't believe, it doesn't mean anything. God is still there. Even if an atheist says he isn't. God is still right. Even if the Bible corrector says that he's wrong in certain places in the Bible. What you think has no effect on anything when it comes to God and what God says. The oracles of God are right and man is always wrong. So has the word come to you? Do you know the gospel? You know that there is a payment for sin. So are you lost? If you're going to be saved, you have to be lost first. For God to find you, you have to be lost. Now, every person needs to be saved. And if you're unsaved, you're lost even if you don't know you're lost. Once you realize that you have sinned and that you're in danger of 
of eternal damnation in hell, you're ready to be saved. This means you've reached what they refer to as the age of accountability. Once you realize you're a sinner, it's your responsibility to accept the payment for the sin that you've committed. Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid, referring back to the verse where it said, For if, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Paul says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So God is true, but every man is a liar. So every man is a sinner. And you can't mention the gospel without mentioning that men are sinners. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He shed his blood for our sins. So, can you be saved? Have you heard the word? And do you realize you're a sinner? The Bible says, Like God be true, but every man a liar. Even godly men are liars. When any Christian changes the word of God, he's a liar. It's a great illustration that God is true and every man is a liar. When you should see a, a person change the word of God, that's just a great picture of how God is true, but every man is a liar. So Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Who's it talking about being judged? It's talking about God. And God's, saying, God's sayings are the oracles. When it says that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, that's talking about the oracles. In the verse, it is God that's being judged. And what this means is that at the great white throne, the Lord is going to give every man the opportunity to ask him whatever they want and try to justify themselves over him. For example, they may say, if you're a loving God, then why would you throw me into the lake of fire? And the Lord would just answer with the oracles of God, just like he always does. Just like Jesus Christ answered the devil with the oracles of God. And he answered the Pharisees of his day by the oracles of God. He would always say, it is written, or have you not read? He will let his word justify him. And they will be speechless. And all they'll be able to say is, amen, and you're right, as they're thrown into the lake of fire. Because they had the opportunity to believe the gospel and be saved, but they rejected it. Romans 3, 4, or 3, 5 says, But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? And then notice he says, I speak as a man. Notice Paul says, if our unrighteousness. Man is unrighteous. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. We are sinners exceedingly before the Lord, and we need the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that we can go to heaven. If our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? Then he says, I speak as a man. Notice he's saying, I speak as a man, because if someone asks this question, it's foolish. And man is foolish. It is foolish to think that God is unrighteous for taking vengeance on us sinners. And just because our unrighteousness reveals the mercy and goodness and long-suffering and gentleness and glory of God and reveals all those good attributes of God, it doesn't mean God is unrighteous for taking vengeance on us. Think about this. If it wasn't for man being a wicked sinner, the Lord wouldn't be able to show us all those good attributes like his mercy and his long suffering. But just because our unrighteousness works out for his glory, this doesn't mean he is unrighteous for taking vengeance on man for sinning and rejecting him. Now Romans three, six and seven it says, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? Notice Paul's always saying, God forbid. This alone shows you that God forbids some things. God just isn't some God up in the clouds that's okay with everything. It says, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I ju also judged as a sinner? And notice Paul is speaking as a man. It says, The truth of God, it says, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, uh, you're the. The truth of God doesn't abound more through your lie. 
even though the wickedness of man works out to get God glory, it doesn't mean the truth of God abounds more through your lie. It would abound more through you telling the truth and doing what God says and living by the Bible and staying true to what the Bible says and not changing it. But even when you do go against the Bible, even when you do go against what God said, He still gets the glory because it shows that God is merciful. It shows He's long-suffering. It shows He puts up with people. And you have a God of second chances. He's going to get the glory either way. Now verse 8, it says, And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So people were accusing Paul of saying, Well, he teaches that it's good and right to continue living in sin because the grace of God abounds. And the more you sin, the more you show the grace of God. A lot of people think that, Well, I can just keep sinning because God is graceful and He's a loving God and He's a merciful God, so He's going to be okay with it. That's not true. Or they'll think, well, the more I sin, that just shows how great God is because He's going to forgive me. Just keep on forgiving me over and over. But you don't want to live that way. Paul was slanderously reported. And there are men today who teach that you can lose their salvation, that you can lose salvation. And so when someone like me teaches you can't lose your salvation, they say, well, he thinks he has a license to sin. And no, we can't lose our salvation Nothing we do can make us lose salvation, but we should try to do right. We should try to live right. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound, as Paul says? He says, God forbid to that. We should try our best not to sin because we love God. We should try our best not to sin because we want to do what the Bible says, not in order to keep salvation or to get saved. But men love to slander the people of God. They'll look at you and they'll say, You believe once saved, always saved. So you think a man can go out and do whatever they want to do. And I don't know anybody who teaches once saved, always saved, who thinks a man should just go out and live for the world and the flesh and the devil because they're eternally secure. Now Romans 3, 9 through 12, it says, What then? Are we better than they? No and no wise. For we have... Before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin, as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And that describes every person who has ever lived. Paul says, Are we better than they? No, and no wise. He is saying the Jews are no better than the Gentiles. They are all under sin. Just because God gave them certain promises doesn't mean they were without sin. And God never promised them that they would go to heaven just because they're a Jew. They have, they have to come to Jesus Christ just like any Gentile. Paul says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And Isaiah 64, 6 talks about our righteousness being as filthy rags. We can't go around to establish our own righteousness. Paul says in verse 11, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. So this is referring to spiritual things. The lost man doesn't understand spiritual things. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I remember looking at the Bible as a lost person. I'm like, what is this? I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's boring. It's silly. But that's because I did, wasn't saved. I didn't have the Holy Spirit in me revealing all this stuff to me and making me love the Word. Romans 3.12 says, They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Notice that phrase, They are all gone out of the way. I had a friend in high school who got on drugs and alcohol and everyone, everyone started saying the phrase, He got in a bad way. So which way are you going? Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Jesus Christ talks about a broad way. Matthew 7.13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, 
and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So are you going the opposite way of Jesus Christ? If so, then you are going the way of the transgressor. Proverbs thirteen fifteen says, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. So which way do you need to go? You need to run towards Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Are you going the way to hell? Don't worry about giving up your sins to be saved. You don't get on the way to heaven by giving up sin. You get on your way to heaven by looking the right way. Once you look the right way towards Jesus Christ, believing the gospel in your heart to salvation, you can then begin to live like you're on the right way. You can't live right unless you have the Holy Spirit inside of you telling you how to live. And the moment you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You'll be able to understand the scriptures that tell you how to live right. You'll understand preaching that will tell you how to live right. And when you read the Word of God and hear the Word of God, it convicts your heart and tells you what sins that you need to stop doing. It'll show the sin in your life. The Bible and preaching makes sin appear exceeding sinful. But you don't quit sins to be saved. You get saved by believing the gospel. And then the Lord will help you get victory over the sins of the flesh. So are you lost? To be saved, you have to be lost. Do you realize you're a sinner? Romans three thirteen through 18 shows us we have wicked, sinful bodies. Look at verse 13 in Romans chapter 3, in the chapter we're studying. It says, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. So everything about your mouth is wicked. Look at that. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. So there you have throat, tongue, and lips. Your throat is an open sepulcher. You put dead things in it. Your tongue is full of, de full of deceit. You lie all the time and don't even realize it because, as James says, your tongue is set on the fire of hell. Your words can be so bad that it is described as the poison of asps being under your lips. This is because you can kill men's testimonies, their character, their marriage, their career, all with words that come out of your mouth. Words can kill because they come out of an open, open sepulcher. Uh, your mouth can spread death. Psalms 5 and verse 9 says, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. And even the Lord Jesus Christ talked about how the evil comes from within. It's worse to have evil come out, to have bad things come out of your mouth, than it is to put bad food in your mouth. A lot of people are worried about the food that they're putting in more than they are about what's coming out of their mouth. And did you realize that what Adam and, A Adam and Eve put in their mouth led to their death spiritually and physically? With the mouth, Eve changed what God said. And Adam lied to God with his mouth. Sins of the mouth are the most easy and common sin to commit. It is right smack dab in the middle of your face, and all you have to do is say what's on your mind. That's why that's a bad idea to just say what's on your mind. And when people say, I just, I just speak what's on my mind, I know they must commit a lot of sins of the mouth. And Paul says that you need to study to be quiet. That means learn to shut up every now and then. You already sinned once when you think about wicked things and the insults and the dirty jokes. But then you sin again when you actually say it. And then I believe you sin a third time if you say it in front of somebody else. Romans 3.14 says, Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Have you ever been around someone who just curses and breathes out bitterness under their breath? They are full of evil inside, in their mind and in their thoughts and everything in their heart is just full of evil and it comes out 
maybe under their breath, maybe out loud. The Golden State Killer, who was caught recently, earlier this year or last year, murdered many people and raped people for over a decade. He was full of cursing and bitterness. His neighbors said they could hear him cursing and muttering wicked things under his breath when he was in his yard. I know people that they have a mouth of cursing and bitterness. They're always mad, always bitter, always mumbling and cussing. James 3.10 says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So don't be like that. When you're around your Christian friends, a lot of times you're talking wholesome and godly and saying, God bless you and praise the Lord, hallelujah and amen. And then when you go to work, you start cussing up a storm and telling dirty jokes and laughing at dirty jokes. The laughter that comes out of your mouth can be a sin. Are you laughing at things that you shouldn't be laughing at? Don't let sweet water and bitter water come out of the same place, as James talks about. In Romans 3.15, back to Romans chapter 3, it says, Their feet are swift to shed blood. Proverbs 6.18 says, The Lord hates feet that be swift and running to mischief. Some people just run around with the purpose of getting into something evil, hurting someone else and someone else's family members. Think about this. Every person you hurt is somebody's daughter. It's somebody's husband or wife or father or mother. Do you want someone hurting the people that you love? Every time that you're about to hurt someone with your words or with your hands, remember that's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's son, that's somebody's father or mother. There's some person on earth that really loves that person, and then you're going to be mean to that person. Imagine if that was your daughter or your mother or your sister. Romans 3.16 says destruction and misery are in their ways. So are you lost? Your sins do nothing but destroy and lead to misery. Misery on earth and misery in hell. In Revelation it talks about people who are going to be in the lake of fire. And it says... They have no rest, day nor night. The Bible says, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. The Bible says, He that liveth for the flesh shall die. That's true for saved and unsaved. The more you live for the flesh, the quicker you'll be brought to the grave. The quicker you'll wake up hurting in a hospital bed. Destruction and misery is in your ways. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul talks about how Jesus is coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. That fire that comes out of the Lord Jesus Christ's mouth at the second advent will form a lake of fire, and those people are going to face everlasting destruction. You are on the way of a transgressor if you're lost you are on the broad way to hell you're on the way of destruction and misery uh, the only comfort in hell will be the devil who gets comfort over seeing you in misery misery loves company the devil knows he's going to hell and he wants you to be in misery with him Romans 3.17 in the way of peace have they not known Jesus Christ is the way of peace. Isaiah calls him the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Right now, he is offering you peace with God. And when you get saved, you get the peace of God when you live for him. In the time of Jacob's trouble, he is going to take peace from the earth. If you know him, then you know peace. If you don't know him, you'll have no peace. Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The Bible talks about several times the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of man bringeth a snare. This is the problem with man. Every time he sins is because he doesn't fear God. Every time he does something wicked, he's not fearing God like he should. Every time you sinned, you lacked the fear of God. God sees you sinning. 
He knows what you're doing and he has the power to take your breath away. If you're lost, he has the power to throw you in hell. When you sin in God's face, you're not being brave, you're being stupid. I've seen a video of a man charging a police officer with a meat cleaver and the officer kept telling him, telling him to stop, to put his hands up, to lay down on the ground, but he just kept coming to the officer until the officer had to shoot him. And as he lay dying on the ground, the man said, I just want my soul saved. And sometimes you don't think about eternity until you're dying. And when you just sin and have no fear of God before your eyes, you're like that man just charging God with a hammer, showing no fear. And then when you get up there after death, you're at the great white throne judgment, you're going to say, I just want my soul saved. But it'll be too late and you'll be cast into the lake of fire. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that what, the, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The purpose of the law was never to save those who kept the law. In the Old Testament, no man ever kept the law perfectly, meaning no man ever went their entire life without breaking it. And they would have to keep the law and offer the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it to get temporary forgiveness. But those sacrifices never cleared them of their sin. Keeping the law and offering the blood of bulls and goats never gave someone eternal salvation. The law showed man that he's a sinner because no one can keep the law perfectly. Only Jesus Christ could. He is the only one righteous. So every mouth needs to be stopped. As the verse said in Romans 3.19, every mouth needs to be stopped and all the world become guilty before God because you're a guilty sinner. And what man will do at the great white throne judgment is he's going to try to talk his way out of it. He's going to try to justify his sin. He's going to try to say why God isn't fair. But you can't talk your way out of hell. You need Jesus Christ. Now Romans 3.20, it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law brings us to Jesus Christ because it shows us we are a sinner and in need of a Savior. We have all broke the laws, and if you offend in one point, then you're guilty of all. As the Bible says. And Paul told Timothy, he says, The law is good if a man use it lawfully. You use it lawfully when you show a man he's a sinner by showing he's broke the law. Using it unlawfully is when you're trying to get men in bondage and making them think they have to keep the law to be saved. But no flesh will be justified by the deeds of the law. If you're justified then the Lord has declared you righteous. You can only be justified through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can only get justified by His blood when you believe on Jesus Christ as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. You need to put your faith on Him and what He did on the cross to be your payment for sin. So can you be saved? Yes. You have heard the Word. You've heard the Gospel. You now realize you're a sinner. If you've heard what I've said and believe what I'm saying, then you know you've sinned against God. And next, all you need to do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you receive the righteousness of God. To spend eternity with God, you have to be as perfect as Jesus Christ. We can't get that perfection on our own because we are sinful men. It's impossible for us to live good enough to get to heaven. But He has come down manifested himself in the flesh. God manifested in the flesh as the Lord Jesus Christ and he died on the cross so that we could receive him as our Savior and get imputed righteousness. That means we get the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness. He has to give that perfection to us. It's a gift. And since it is his righteousness and he's giving it to us, we have no room to brag on anybody but the Lord himself. 
the moment you will believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior, He will put the righteousness and perfect record of Jesus Christ on your soul and take away your sinful record. Romans 3.21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Romans 10.4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. What does that mean that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness? Well, in the Old Testament, if a man kept the law and offered the prescribed sacrifice, when he broke it, it was his righteousness. Deuteronomy 6.25 says, And it shall be our righteousness if we, uh, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Notice the verse said, It shall be our righteousness. But that's still a problem. They didn't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to their soul. And for this reason, the Old Testament saints weren't born again. They didn't have eternal salvation. They didn't have their sins washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They couldn't go to the third heaven when they died. They weren't born, born again, spiritually circumcised. They weren't redeemed. And even though they had sins temporarily forgiven when they offered an animal sacrifice, these blood of bulls and goats couldn't clear the guilty. Exodus 34, 7 tells you that. And these things only let them go to paradise in the heart of the earth when they died. Well, they would wait on the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of people will slanderously report against dispensationalists and teach that we believe that men were eternally saved by keeping the law in the Old Testament. And that's just outright misinformation or a flat-out lie. When none of us even believe that men kept the law perfectly in the Old Testament, no Old Testament saint ever went to the third heaven until Jesus Christ shed his blood. Without the blood, none of them could go to heaven. Because even though they had their own righteousness, that's still a problem. That righteousness was never good enough to merit eternal salvation. So watch out for all these people deceiving you into saying that these dispen that dispensationalists are teaching works-based salvation and all this stuff. That's not true. Romans 3.22 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. See that? You get the righteousness of God when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. And notice it says, All and upon all them that believe. So, all men have an opportunity. Anyone can be saved. God doesn't just choose a few over here to be saved and then damn the rest over here to hell. He isn't a Calvinist. He says, whosoever will. He says, for there is no difference. Why is anybody more important than anybody else? Why do I deserve salvation more than anybody else? Why do I deserve an opportunity to believe the gospel more than the man sitting next to me? It doesn't make any sense. Because Romans 3.23, and the same chapter we're studying, says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I have sinned. You sinned. God is no respecter of persons. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. When it comes to salvation, everybody needs it, and God offer, offers it to everybody. All have sinned and come short. The Bible is against man. So don't brag about yourself concerning salvation because you have come short of the glory of God. You don't get a trophy for participation. You've come short. Uh, you need to believe the gospel. Romans 3.24 says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Notice it said justified freely. You can be declared righteous freely when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God told Adam and Eve that they could freely eat from the trees in the garden. We can freely get salvation and go to heaven so why would you reject a free gift? Being justified freely by His grace. Grace is about God giving you something that you don't deserve. And you don't deserve the righteousness of God. You deserve the lake of fire. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Acts 20.28 20, shows us that He purchased us with His own blood. We were bought by a price. 
If you're saved, then Jesus Christ bought you with his shed blood. And that's redemption. That redemption is in Christ Jesus. He bought you back. The Old Testament saints didn't have it back then, but we have it now if we believe on him. Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Redemption means to buy back. You've been bought by a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, which is his, as the Bible talks about. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So notice it matters what you do with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't just say that it is the same as a as dog's blood or a dead animal's blood. Uh, you don't just say it was his death alone that saves. It's his blood. His blood had to be shed. Over and over you hear about the blood in the Bible. We have propitiation through faith in his blood. So what is propitiation? Propitiation is about a substitute who appeases the wrath of God. When Jesus Christ died and shed his blood on the cross, he appeased the wrath of God on every person that would believe the gospel and get that same blood applied to their soul. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. God's wrath is off of me because of what I did with the Lord Jesus Christ, not because I'm a good person. But God's wrath is off of me because when God sees me now, He no longer sees my sinful flesh. He sees the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on my soul. 1 John 2, 2 says, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 4, 10, Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. There had to be a sacrifice for sin. God is holy and just, but he is also full of mercy. And he ne needed to reconcile all his attributes, all of his holy attributes. And he couldn't let a lost sinner into heaven because he is just. And he won't let anyone get away with wickedness. But at the same time, he loved man enough to die on the cross for them. And this way he can show you his holiness and his mercy at the same time. The Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And when Jesus Christ was dying for the sins of man, this is how the wrath of God was appeased. No doubt about it, it hurt God for his son to die, who was also God in the flesh. But at the same time, this is how the wrath of God was appeased, because there needed to be a perfect sacrifice so that man could be reconciled to God. Isaiah 53.11 says, He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And that's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ bore our iniquities. He became sin for us, even though he knew no sin, so that we could get the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now back to Romans 3, verse 26 says, To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So every person who will believe on Jesus Christ will be justified freely by his grace. Romans three twenty seven. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. You have no right to boast. If you're justified freely by accepting a free gift from someone who did all the work for you, then why would you boast about getting it yourself? It was a free gift that you accepted by, from someone who did all the work himself and you didn't do any work for it. Why would you take credit for any of it? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now Romans 3, 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So nothing you did before salvation and nothing you do after salvation can justify you. You're justified by faith. 
What a man does before and after salvation is completely separate issues from salvation itself. You don't get saved by the deeds of the law or your good works, and you don't maintain salvation by keeping the law and good works. Verse 29 and 30 says, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. So the circumcision is the Jews, the uncircumcision is the Gentiles, and there is no difference. Both groups have sinned and both have to get saved by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is one God who justifies, there is one God who offers a free gift, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Romans 3.31 says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So what this is saying is, do you just forget about the law, even though you're saved by grace through faith? Paul says, God forbid, we establish the law. Anything in the Old Testament that tells us how to live righteously should be applied to our life. Anything in the Gospels and the general epistles that tells us how to live should be applied to our life. You have to rightly divide, though. For example, we don't offer animal sacrifices. Jesus Christ is the perfect sac sacrifice for sin. We don't keep the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. But when the Old Testament says stuff like, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, honor thy father and thy mother, those things never stop being true. And everything in the Bible that tells you how to live good and decent and holy, those should be followed. As long as you rightly divide and make sure that it's for you today. Don't go offering animal sacrifices and stuff like that. But those things like thou shalt not kill. I mean, it's still not right to kill. It's still not right to steal and to talk back to your parents and dishonor your parents. Those things never stop being true. Those things should still be followed. And even though those things don't save us, just because you're saved by grace through faith doesn't mean you should live like the devil. You need to strive to be as righteous as Jesus Christ in your daily life so that your daily life will match how God already sees you since you've been born again. But this has been Romans chapter 3, and anybody can be saved as I've showed you. If you have heard the gospel, you realize your guilt of sin, and you're willing to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on Him, then you can be saved and have eternal life.